Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit. We are taking a closer look at policing, the reforms being proposed at the state level, what that really means for officers on the streets and for us as citizens, plus the Minnesota Attorney General after the George Floyd case on what defunding police could look like, and concerns with facial recognition technology and policing. It's all ahead this week on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by... and viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining me. It has been over a year since the murder of George Floyd at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer sparked protests around the country. Millions of people joined the Black Lives Matter movement against police brutality and marched for justice. And this past year has led to tough conversations on the complicated relationship between police and the communities they serve. There are calls to defund police and mandate reforms, but what does that really mean here in Michigan? Coming up on the show, Will Glover takes a closer look at police reform legislation that is in the Michigan Senate right now. Plus, Nolan Finley and his conversation with Robert Stevenson, the director of the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police. Then, Bill Kubota on facial recognition technology. It is supposed to help in policing, but we'll explore concerns on transparency and how IDs are made. And Stephen Henderson talks with Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison about the prosecution of Derek Chauvin, who will be sentenced in the murder of George Floyd this week. But we are starting off with the bills in the Michigan Senate right now. We are one of 17 states with pending police reform bills. One Detroit's Will Glover takes a look at how these bills could work together and if this legislation is enough for real change. In May of 2020, the murder of George Floyd heightened the demand for police reform. In the years since, over 30 states have passed some sort of legislation. Michigan is still working on it, currently with a package of 13 bills in the Senate. Proposed changes include requiring statewide standards for investigation of officer-involved deaths, banning most no-knock search warrants, requiring officers to intervene when a colleague uses excessive force, and granting agencies authority to penalize those who don't, and studying barriers to requiring and retaining officers. Two of the senators sponsoring the bills explained how the legislation is supposed to work together, and I wanted to get reactions from people who have previously had interactions with police to see if they have faith in what these policies can do. First, here's Republican State Senator Jim Runstead. There are always bad actors in every single profession, and we've seen some of them. Uh, with the George Floyd case, uh, we saw a bad actor. I don't know how you could justify a person handcuffed on the ground and and putting your knee uh, on their neck, where where is the sense in this? Vince McWilliams is a native Detroiter and the owner of the Kill the Hate clothing line. I've been pulled out of my car where I've done nothing wrong and been held at gunpoint, like not understanding why I was pulled out of the car. Like, and everything I have is legit and you had no reason to pull your gun on me. This is Southgate resident Chakuma Udebulnam who worked with multiple law enforcement agencies during his five years as a TSA employee. I could get pulled over tomorrow and I'm just harassed because of the color of my skin. And it's like, I don't, I hate to have to get into that. I hate, you know, talking about racial things, but it is what it is. Julie DeMar, Westland resident and host of the pop culture podcast, Selective Hearing. I've been actually beat up by BPD about mm. 12 years ago. First time ever going to the after hours with friends after a club. Did not know that after hours were illegal. And the police ran in and they had all full tactical gear they had uh, assault rifles out. I, honest to God, I thought that the nightclub was getting robbed. 
That was my initial reaction to it. And I started asking when I realized it was the police, like, what happened? What's going on? And they told me to shut the up. And the officer literally beat me up. Yeah, there's absolutely a need for a balanced approach to make sure that we're curtailing these bad actors, that we're making sure they can't uh, prey upon the society. At the same time, you've got to make these very limited so you're not making it so every officer thinks that, hey, if I react too quickly, I go to jail. If I react too slowly, I'm six feet under the ground and nobody wants to go into the profession. Democratic State Senator Stephanie Chang is also a sponsor of the Senate bill package. Her bill would require law enforcement agencies to adopt certain policies on the use of force by law enforcement officers, a policy that already exists in the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards that is currently in use by police agencies like the Detroit Police Department. These are things that we've started to see, um, but we need consistency across the entire state um, so that we know that every single Michigander can know exactly uh, what type of use of force is, is um, is allowable and what the policies are. So we hear testimony from law enforcement, from individuals who have intersected with uh, law enforcement. So you get a, a real breadth of uh, experiences about what do these individual bills mean? Uh, do they need modification? Is there improvements that can be made? And in just about every case, we've gotten feedback that there needs to be some changes. Where do these people live that you're actually talking to? I know if I go into Oak Park or Royal Oak, the police are different from they are in Detroit. They're different all around. Three of these bills include disciplinary actions against officers. One gives the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards the ability to revoke the licenses of officers who use excessive force that causes death. Another fines an officer up to $500 for revealing the identity of a citizen who filed a complaint. And one bill disciplines officers who knowingly and intentionally tamper with evidence or their body cameras. If these bills were to pass and this is a requirement by law to have certain policies in place, what happens to departments or officers who don't comply? The bills, I think, really need to work in tandem with one another. So there's still a chance that maybe some things might pass, but other things that might hold officers accountable, which is kind of the largest goal, may not pass. I mean, my hope is that the entire package will move together as a group. I think that these policies of, of banning certain practices, except for certain very, 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 very limited circumstances, and for having very clear use of force policies, is, is all of those things are just so important on the preventative side. Um, right. And so they're equally important as we're also talking about accountability at the back end. Accountability is huge. Just like right. in anything else, they, should, they shouldn't be, they're not beyond reproach, just like I'm not. Oh, we'll touch on that on the back end. That's what infuriates me is because that's pretty much you're telling me, I don't know. And in a sense, I'm not really thinking about it. Yeah, I'll take a look at each one of them in terms of and ask questions, what are the penalties? But um, I, I think that these law enforcement officers are gonna be very, very constrained by what we put through. But again, I'll go back and take a look at the penalty phase of these. The package of police reform bills in the Senate have been introduced and are awaiting review by the Judiciary Committee. Michigan House Democrats have introduced a similar package that additionally aims to end qualified immunity for police officers. For Chikuma, the question of whether or not reforms will impact his daily life still remains. I want to drive stress-free. I want to be able to call 911 stress-free. I want to be able to see a police officer and be stress-free. And until we get more than just reform change, it's not gonna make a difference. We will continue to update you on where the legislation stands throughout the year. In police departments throughout the state, there are conversations about excessive force, the need for more training, and connecting with the community. It's the police chiefs who set the tone for their departments. Nolan Finley spoke with Robert Stevenson, who's currently the director of the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police, about changes in policing. You've been in this business 47 years. You were the longtime chief of the city of Livonia, started your career there, and 10 years now as director of the uh, association. What is the state of your profession today? I would say upheaval mm -hmm. describes it very much, Nolan. I've never seen anything quite like this, uh, precipitated by mm -hmm. uh, the killing of George Floyd right. and what has been the outcome and the fallout from that. And I've truly never seen anything like this. 
The chiefs agree, though, I think that reform is necessary. And you have been spending much of the last year working with communities and their activists and the people who want to see reforms to try to come to some sort of agreement. What is the right mix? I like to use a different term than police reform. Can we improve? Absolutely. Any Every profession should constantly be improving. What I did 40 years ago when I started, we don't do today. And what we're doing today, we're not going to do 40 years from now. And I would point to this, Nolan, that a lot of people don't realize this. We started a police accreditation program with the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police five years ago. Uh And much of what they're calling for in reform are things that we have in our accreditation program already. Departments should have, and if you're going to be accredited, duty to intervene has to have bias-based policing policies being prohibited along with training, training for dealing with people with mental illness. Um, No-knock warrants are currently against the law in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Michigan's law right now says you have to knock and announce. Chokeholds, there have already been ruled that they're deadly force by the Sixth Circuit. So a lot of the things that people are calling for, saying a reform, we've actually either already called for or they're actually already there. So... The state legislature bill was introduced last week to end qualified immunity for police officers. How do you feel about that? That would probably be the worst thing that could happen to our profession so far. What it does is it takes away the ability for police officers to have protection when they make good faith, uh, take action in good faith that the courts may later rule is unconstitutional. But at the time that they did it, it wasn't known. It would hold them personally liable. And the other thing which people don't think about here, this has to do a lot with cities too, because when the officer gets sued, the city's going to get sued. And almost everything we would do would then be open for lawsuit. You've put in place a number of measures already in Michigan. What still needs to be done? We need to have some resources to deal with the mentally ill people that we deal with. Unfortunately, so many of these incidents that happen, these tragic incidents, deal with people that have mental illness. And one of the largest treaters of mental illness is our jails and our county jails. We don't have the facilities to do that. So um, we have the opportunity to start to see some involvement of mental health experts and actually social workers in there because a lot of what the police do truly aren't criminal activity, but there's nobody else for anybody to call at two o'clock in the morning when they have somebody that's acting up other than the police. What about putting police together and with the community on a more personal level? I, I believe that's also a good opportunity that needs to be taken care of. Many departments now are regularly meeting with their activist communities. You need to get to know each other before something bad happens because those relationships are already there. And it's easier to deal with something when you know the people on the other side. Departments across the state are embracing technology when it comes to policing, but facial recognition programs and software have been problematic when it comes to proper ID and privacy. One Detroit's Bill Kubota has the story. The best way to put it is that we have entered a world of policing that is the stuff of science fiction. Enhanced 5719. We've been watching this stuff, facial recognition technology, biometrics, the machine sees everything, in movies, on TV, for decades. What the heck? Is that a facial recognition scanner? The technology is here. How do we make it efficient and reliable enough that we can depend on it? Tyrone Carter worked in law enforcement before becoming a state rep. Very few things have really changed about policing, except technology has has enhanced it, made it better. When I hired in, I I tell people, I carried a 357. We didn't even have semi-automatics back then. A huge radio, handcuffs, and that was it. Last year, Carter wanted to slow the roll on facial recognition, needs more discussion, but he says it can be a good investigative tool. You know, Shobita Parthasarty looks at technology and equity issues. We published a report a year ago and looked at this and we saw that it really is being used around the world, but without much regulation. The Michigan State Police has the SNAP program using facial recognition. Not regulated, really. MSP observes a policy developed by the FBI. Our database consists of roughly 54 million images. 
if they were arrested in our state or have a valid driver's license in our, our state, yeah, then that's what we would have. Odds are you're in there, maybe a few times. The state police facial recognition package comes from DataWorks Plus in South Carolina. The Detroit Police Department is also a client. The image was so clear, it was amazing. Facial recognition came to the fore when police started watching video feeds from around the city. The program, Project Greenlight. The high school I went to, the colors were green and white. So I have a thing with green. CAS Tech alum and then Police Chief James Craig explains green light to out-of-town reporters in 2018. Our carjackings plummeted. And the reason why that happens is because, frankly, carjackings were occurring at gas stations and liquor stores. So we're being watched. But if they ID us with live video without probable cause? There are civil libertarians who don't like that idea. That contract stated that an objective a project objective was to run facial recognition across live Project Greenlight feeds. No indication that's happened, but many worried it could. For better or worse, Detroit is a leader when it comes to the use of facial recognition technology. But then how does facial recognition work anyway? There are biases that make it less accurate, essentially among anyone who isn't a white man because the training data was very homogenous, then the assumptions that this algorithm makes is based on the measurements of your average middle-aged white guy. But this is Detroit, where cameras point mostly at people of color. These communities of color have extremely long legacies of surveillance, even that date back to the founding of the country. Certain people had to carry lanterns for easier identification when slavery was a thing. Remember COINTELPRO, electronic eavesdropping on Martin Luther King? But these are different times. What's to worry now? If you're not doing anything wrong, what, what's the big deal? Our client, Robert Williams, uh, had his photo in the database, and he wasn't doing anything wrong. And that didn't stop the Detroit police from, based on a facial recognition check, arresting him one day in his front lawn in front of his wife and two children, taking him to jail and holding him for approximately 30 hours where he had to sleep overnight on a concrete bench. All this revealed last year when a Detroit cop used Williams' picture from the state police database in a shoplifting case. MSP did not say it was a positive match, but the arresting officers seemed to take it that way. Our investigative lead reports uh, do indicate right on them that it's, it's not probable cause for arrest, that it is a viable candidate, you know, that further, further investigation is required to utilize that lead. So is it about the technology or is it about just bad police work here? I think it's, it's about both the technology and the police work, and it's about the causal effect between the two. The simple fact is, using shoddy technology creates shoddy police work. We know this from our, from our daily lived life, that when a computer tells us something, we're inclined to trust it and sort of confirm what it already tells us. Like Phil Mayer says, taking directions on our GPS. I don't know hardly anybody who can't recount having turned the wrong way because Google Maps told them to, even when they knew very well that they were turning the wrong way at the time. Someone else arrested for raising his voice about facial recognition. We're gonna take a five minute recess. Willie Burton, Detroit Board of Police Commissioner, gaveled out of order. Police departments struggle to correct the bad apples. But yet, as an elected body, you move swift to arrest someone for simply questioning the policy and the procedure. Let the commissioner go! I stood up to protect our civil liberties. Burton said he got a concussion. He's suing the PD. San Francisco banned his technology. Portland banned the technology. Berkeley ban this technology. Berkeley, as in California, Boston and Minneapolis banned it too. We just had a county called King County in the state of Washington. One of the whitest counties in America just banned this technology. Why does America, blackest poor city Detroit, has to, it doesn't make any sense. The commission voted strong approval of the technology Perhaps Burton's arrest, prescient, coming before the Williams incident and two others, both African-American men in New Jersey and again in Detroit. That's only three. 
That isn't very many people that have been picked out wrongly by this facial recognition technology. To, to which I would say, Bill, only three that we know of and have been able to be proven. This is a tip of an iceberg type problem. The, the vast majority of people are never told when facial recognition technology is used. In Mr. Williams's case, the only reason he found out was because the police were so surprised when they were speaking to him to realize that the photo was wrong that they said, huh, the computer must have got it wrong. The police commissioners have set guidelines for the technology only to be used for violent crimes. And last month, city council passed what's called the Community Input Over Government Surveillance Ordinance. And we hope that this will safeguard residents from having surveillance technologies forced upon them that don't do what they were told that they would do. There will always be some form of surveillance. If you're African American, you're always going to have that. Now we have become the majority of elected and appointed officials, and we're going to double down on stuff. And with history and, and research behind it that says it doesn't work, at the end of the day, it comes down to thinking or lack of. This week, Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis police officer convicted of the murder of George Floyd, will be sentenced. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison is also a Detroit native. He spoke with Stephen Henderson on American Black Journal about Chauvin's prosecution and about calls for defunding the police. The idea of deconstructing and reconstructing the police, what, do you think we have to go to that extreme? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, but I would never uh, adopt the idea, the, the language of defund the police, abolish the police. I wouldn't use that term. What I would say is we need to make the main thing the main thing. What's the main thing? Public safety is the main thing. We're trying to keep people safe. How do we do that? Is having every single case responded with an armed person with a gun whose training is to use the gun or the nightstick the only way to achieve public safety. I would say that in some cases it is, you get an armed shooter, you need that. You have somebody threatening violence, you might need that. But what about George Floyd, where he was accused of a fake 20? Do you need a armed response to essentially a low level property offense where nobody has ever alleged that George Floyd even knew that the fake, the 20 was fake? And then what about people who are in mental health crises? I mean, if you don't, if you're an officer who wants to help, but this person just looks angry and maybe they look assaultive, but they haven't yet assaulted anyone, maybe they are in a autistic meltdown. What you need there is a professional who's going to come and ascertain the problem and de-escalate the problem. I mean, how many situations do you need another skill set? And I think to a certain extent, American policing has let punitive measures and tough guy tactics be a surrogate for public safety. And I think that we need to get back to let's keep the community safe and we will have armed people responding to crises. That is an inevitability. We will also do a lot more upstream things. We will reduce the number of unnecessary contacts. I mean, if you have a camera, why do you need to stop somebody? They could have let Dante Wright go yes. and then mailed him his ticket for uh, late tags, right? And, the, and, you know, police have learned years ago that high-speed chases are probably more dangerous. It's probably safer to let that person go than to chase them, you know, because then they get in an accident and kill civilians. So we're, we need to really put public safety as the driver, not I'm a macho man and don't you talk back to me. And if you sass me, I'm going to uh, stick a gun in your face and call you a lot of foul names. I mean, if you just, what the police did to George Floyd in the very first is deemed to be by our existing law legal. Mm -hmm. But in the very beginning, it's like, put the gun up in his hands. He's got the hand gun cocked sideways, get the F out of the car. I would submit to you that while the law protects the officer's behavior in that situation because he didn't see his hands, that sort of set the tone for the entire encounter. Yeah. Look, is there an occasion where an officer has to draw a firearm on a person? 
Sure, there is. I believe in officer safety and officer wellness. But if your first move is, show me your effing hands. I mean, you know, honestly, a lot of people in our society don't believe African-Americans are routinely treated that way. That's one of the reasons I'm glad this case was televised, so that the world could see here is, this is routine in certain parts of our country. And in other parts of our country, it would be, it would be absolutely intolerable. For more from American Black Journal, just head to our website at OneDetroitPBS.org. We will continue to bring you stories about police reform and so much more every Thursday, right here on Detroit Public Television. For all of us at One Detroit, I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you next week and take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by... And viewers like you.